Now we've uh, come to the end of uh, our, our look in 1 Samuel and the book of 1 Samuel concerns Israel's quest for a leader worth following. The people, if you remember, had demanded a king like the other nations and they got their king. But many years later, as dead Israelites lie strewn across the battlefield and their own king dies beneath his own sword, it's clear this wasn't a leader worth following. And yet at the same time, I think 1 Samuel concerns a parallel quest, a deeper quest. Because while most people are busy looking for the wrong answer, there are some who have learnt to follow the true king. People like Hannah, Samuel, Jonathan and David. Heroes of faith who realise that human weakness is no cause for panic, that there is a king in Israel, Jehovah, the faithful covenant God, and that in our weakness, in their weakness, there is grace and strength to be found in him. So you've got these two parallel lines, if you like, parallel quests in 1 Samuel. You've got sinners looking for a human answer, and you've got God's remnant looking for a divine answer. And I think that's why, as 1 Samuel comes to a close, it ends in both failure and it ends with hope. The people's choice, the people's king Saul, has utterly failed. But God's choice, David, is in the wings. Saul did it his way. It was disastrous. David has learned in God's school and has learned to hold on to the true king. This morning I think we will see it again, and we've seen it often in these chapters, that basic contrast between David and Saul. And we'll look at that as night falls in Israel. And also we will remember the true king is still on the throne. And the darkest part of the night is just before the dawn. Now last time, if you remember, we, we saw how the Bible narrator, as it were, leaves David hanging and he flashes forward to describe Saul's awful predicament. And now in chapter 29, we go back in time and we return to David. Now, David has got this awful dilemma. He's been enlisted by Achish to fight with the Philistines against Israel. And he can't afford to do that. It would mean fighting against his own people, against God's people. And quite apart from that being a sin and wrong, it would also never have been forgiven by the Israelites. David could never have recovered and ascended to the throne. And yet at the same time, David can't afford not to fight with Achish because the king assumed his loyalty. To refuse to fight would blow his cover. And he didn't even have the option of absconding and going over to the Israelite camp secretly because, of course, if he did, Saul would have undoubtedly killed him. So from every angle, David is trapped in this impossible dilemma. And yet God is a gentle, generous teacher. And as so often before in this book, God is going to intervene. And we're going to see two tokens of his loving care. And here's the first. God sends grace to overcome sinful failure. Now, the uh, Philistines have gathered all their forces at Aphek. And there should be a slide coming up on the, the screen shortly, I think, just to show... Um, where all these things are going on. So they're at Aphek. They're about 40 miles south of the Jezreel Valley, which is where Saul and his men are gathering. And Achish's troops are marching with David and his men in the rear. Now, as far as Achish is concerned, there's not a problem. As far as he's concerned, David's been loyal for 16 months. He's apparently been faultless. Now, of course, Achish doesn't know that uh, David's activities on the border had not been to further his interests, but to fight and destroy Israel's enemies. But Achish doesn't know that. He's fine. David can march with them. David's an asset. But Achish isn't the only big name in town. The Philistines were basically five city states. Each state had a ruling king or a lord. And Achish is only one of those five kings. And the other Philistine kings, with their army commanders, are very unnerved by the prospect of David fighting with them. Yes, Achish can point to the last 16 months, but these other commanders take a far longer term view. 
they remember that David used to fight against them with great success, defeated Goliath. They remember the song that was sung about David after he defeated Goliath. Saul has slain his thousands and David is tens of thousands. And who were these tens of thousands? Yeah, they were Philistines. Now, yes, they know that David is out of favour with Saul, but they quite reasonably calculate that the best way for David to try and regain favour would be to suddenly turn on the Philistines on the battlefield. And because they outnumber Achish, their will prevails. After all, a successful army has to be a united one. There can't be any doubts as to the loyalty of, of some of the men. And so Achish reluctantly agrees. And David is sent on his way in peace and with Achish's blessing. And that's that. So low key, isn't it? Just like that, David's impossible dilemma is solved. It's so low key that we might be tempted to just write it off as, you know, it's one of those things. But of course, this isn't secular history, is it? And the Bible writer doesn't believe in luck. This is God at work. Now remember, David was in this compromised position in the first place because of his own folly. The Lord hadn't told him to go there. It was David who'd made that decision. He'd fled in fear of Saul, not faith. But the wonderful truth is, and we see this throughout the Bible and we see it in our own lives, where sin increases, grace increases all the more. Divine grace, greater than any human sin. This is the Lord looking after his anointed one. But if you're a Christian here today, if you're trusting in the anointed one, in Jesus, who's paid for every one of your sins on the cross, then by faith you're an adopted member of his family. You're privileged and the Lord looks after his family members. I think we can adopt David's words in Psalm 23 as our own. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, even in the dark valley. There's no escape from God's judgment for Saul and for all who harden themselves against God, but at the same time, for children of faith, there's no escape from his grace. And that's something to encourage us, isn't it? Don't miss God because you think that what's happened is too small to be God. You know, God, I'm expecting a, a lightning bolt from heaven or some dramatic deliverance. And don't despise the smaller mercies. No, there wasn't a, a dramatic miracle here, was there? Some supernatural event. And perhaps David doesn't immediately realise who's the author of this. But it's God's hand at work. This is God's grace. So when those small, low-key things in your lives occur that really help you, Things that the world says, oh, that's just a coincidence. You know different, don't you, if you're trusting in Jesus. Don't despise them. God is at work. He works in the big, yes, but he also works in the small. And he's looking out for you in grace. And don't despair when, through your own sinful failures, you've got yourself in a tangle again. There are temporal consequences for sins. David knew this. But those consequences are never as great as they could be because the Lord's grace is greater by far than your sin. And if you're trusting in his son, then he sees you as his son and he loves you and he's got you. And that's what we see here with David, who got himself into a tangle. But the Lord's grace is greater than that tangle. But for David, it's about to be out of the frying pan and into the fire. Because while the uh, momentous events of chapter 31 are playing out, which we will consider a bit later, and disaster is befalling Israel, David is going to encounter a smaller but just as devastating disaster. You see, while he'd been away on his uh, adventure with the Philistines, marching up the, the coast, the Amalekites had wreaked revenge for all those raids of David that we thought about back in chapter 27. Remember that David had been given the town of Ziklag, and that town had been left undefended. Only the women and children remained in that town. And so what did the Amalekites do? They sweep in, they take all the women and children captive, they take all the plunder, and they burn the town down. Pure opportunism 
But not only that, because if you know your Bible history, you will remember that the Amalekites were historic enemies of Israel. This is just the latest front in a long war. Almost from the very moment Israel left Egypt, there were the Amalekites trying to destroy them. That's why Saul had been commissioned back in chapter 15 to destroy them. And he'd failed, of course. And uh, this time last year, I was going through the book of Esther with you. And what do we find there? A wicked man named Haman. And who was Haman? Well, he was descended from the Amalekites. So these are not just cruel, ruthless, opportunistic people. These are wicked, God-hating people. And it's a stunning blow. David and his men weep until they, they can't weep any longer. You get to that point when you just haven't got any tears left. And weeping then turns to anger. And as is so often the case, men look around for someone to blame. And of course, naturally, David is the leader. He's the decision maker and he's the easy scapegoat. And they talk of stoning him. And poor David, who himself has lost everything, is in despair. He hits rock bottom. And it's at this personal nadir that we read of the second of God's tokens to David. Strength that sustains in time of trial. We read in verse 6 of chapter 30, But David found strength in the Lord his God. Now this is an extraordinary verse because of the circumstances. It's not extraordinary in what David does because he doesn't do anything superhuman or extraordinary. He merely does what we may do and can do in every trial. So what does he do? Well, remember back in 1 Samuel 23 when David's on the run from Saul and he's encouraged unexpectedly by his great friend, Jonathan, the crown prince. And Jonathan, we're told, helped him to find strength in the Lord. How did he do it? By reminding him of the reality. Don't be afraid. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You shall be king of Israel. See, Jonathan was confident that despite everything that was going on, despite appearances to the contrary, David would be king of Israel. Why? Because sovereign God had anointed him and empowered him and protected him. David was God's man and Jonathan knew it. And this was the invisible reality that David's faith needed to cling to. And this is where Jonathan pointed him to, to the word of God, the promises of God. And now, without Jonathan there to help him, surrounded by many who want to kill him, David remembers that lesson. And he turns to that same wonderful God. A God who isn't just an impersonal deity up there, but he's the Lord. He's David's own personal covenant king. One who sticks closer than a brother. Faithful, steadfast, kind. And he remembers the promises of this Lord. The gracious answers of this Lord. That the Lord has a track record of success at looking after him. How through many dangers, toils and snares... He'd been led safely on and he recalls all this in his mind. He rehearses it in his heart. And as he does, it's as if his trial is given a new perspective. And through faith, he's suddenly given new resolve and confidence and assurance. It's exactly as the old chorus says. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Where do we see Jesus? Ultimately in his word and in his dealings with us in our lives. And as we recall to mind those promises, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. I will never leave you nor forsake you. In this world you'll have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So many great and precious promises in the word of Christ. And as we consciously turn away from ourselves and we turn to the word and in time of trouble, the Holy Spirit applies it to our hearts and shows us Jesus and reminds us of all the many times the Lord has delivered us. And that's where strength is to be found. 
It's not superhuman stoicism. It's not sort of gritting your teeth and thinking, I've got to carry on. It's finding strength in the Lord Jesus Christ through his word, by his spirit. And it's amazing what the power of Jesus can do in a person's heart and mind. How it can transform your perspective. Nothing that ever shone shines quite as bright as it used to because nothing can ever compare to Jesus. And on the flip side, no desolation is quite as desolate as it once was because of Jesus. There is balance and there is perspective when our eyes are focused on him. And you see, in gaining that perspective, David now knows what he must do. He inquires of the Lord. Now, that was his regular practice anyway. We, we read it again and again and again. And yet it was noticeably absent in chapter 27 when he fled to the Philistines. Panic informed him, not faith. But now, filled with this new vision of the Lord, what's the first thing, the natural thing for David to do? I'll inquire of the Lord. It's as if he says, you know, I lost sight of it, but I remember in a new way that you've chosen me, Lord, and you've kept me, and your grace has overruled every mistake of mine. You love me, your faithfulness is so much greater than my failure, so I'm going to seek you. Of course I'm going to do that. Of course I'm going to depend upon you for guidance. Of course I want to know what I should do, where I should go. It's you, Lord, I'm going to look to. Perhaps to put it another way, David doesn't just remember God's word, past tense, but he desires to follow God's word, present tense, on into the future. I want to inquire of you, Lord. Through Abiathar the priest, David asks and he receives God's green light. Go and pursue the Amalekite raiding party. You will be successful. Now, if David had been overcome with grief and anxiety and bitterness... He might have been paralysed from action. He might have been so filled with self-pity that he didn't look to to the Lord. He might have just gone ahead and rashly pursued the Amalekites without seeking God's blessing. So much could have gone wrong, couldn't it? But in his time of need, David throws himself upon the Lord. He recalls the Lord's past deliverances. He trusts the Lord's promises. He rests by faith in the Lord. It's not a magic formula. No, problems probably won't just recede into the background straight away. But it is incredible. It really is. The clarity and and the calm assurance that you can have as a believer when you lean on the Lord. When when you fix your eyes on him. And of course we have a greater than Abiathar who was the priest. We have a great high priest. We've got the Lord Jesus who took our sins and our sorrows and made them his own. And in and through him, what does the writer of the Hebrews say? Let us approach the throne of grace with confidence. Confidence, not feeling guilty, not sort of sloping in thinking, oh, I don't know if I want to do this. I'm not sure if he's going to answer me. Let us approach with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. That's what David did, and we can do the same. Well, having uh, already been on the march for several days, and if you take into account all the emotional stress and upheaval, David and his men are exhausted, and a third of them, 200 of them, are too exhausted to cross the ravine and continue the pursuit. But leaving them with their baggage and supplies, David and the other 400 carry on with the chase. And he receives help from an unlikely source, an Egyptian slave, cruelly abandoned by his master when he'd become ill, given assurances that he will be kept safe. The slave gladly leads David to a place where the Amalekites are there, busy eating, drinking, reveling because of all the plunder. It's a scene of false security, which is, of course, what sin does. Sin always gives people a sense of false security, peace, safety, isn't life wonderful? And the Amalekites are complacent. They're off guard. They've got no idea what's to come. David, though we would presume is outnumbered, attacks them suddenly. And from dusk through the night until the evening of the following day, 24 hours the battle rages. And at the end of it, 
Remarkably, David recovers everything. None of the captives are lost. Everything, herds, flocks, everything is brought back. And the question is, when you've experienced a victory like that, a remarkable, against the odds kind of victory, well, what happens? What do you do? This victory is confirmed that the Lord is with David. It's confirmed that he is a true leader of men. Nobody's talking of stoning David anymore. David is now in a more secure position than he ever has been. But of course, pride comes before fall. There are some among David's men who don't wish to share the plunder with those 200 exhausted men who were left with the supplies. I mean, it's our victory. We were the ones that did the fighting. Why should we share it? And it's ruthlessly logical. And a lesser man than David might have agreed. My victory. I led the troops into battle. And yet David's not cocksure. He's not proud. He's filled with the Lord. That's the person he's been focusing on. And he's aware. You see, when you're filled with the Lord, you're always aware that you're a debtor to grace alone. And David's aware of this. This was the Lord's victory. That's why it was so stunning. It was the Lord's plunder. And it should go equally to all who shared in the battle and all who stayed with the supplies. All are to share alike. David even sends some of the plunder to some of the elders of Judah, which was a smart move because David will need all the allies he can get in the future. But I think it demonstrates that grace is infectious. Mean people are often proud people. Well, it's my life. I've achieved all this. It's all mine. And they fall into idolatry. They fall into the sin of self-sufficiency. Me on the throne of my life. But the people who are generous and kind and give what little they do have tend to be people who are very aware of how much they've received from the Lord's hand, how much they are debtors to grace alone. I mean, what do we have that wasn't given us by the Lord? Am I here preaching to you because I've, I've got special spiritual insights? I always knew who God was. Not at all. I'm a debtor to mercy alone. That's why I'm here. That's why you're here. And David learned this lesson well. Through failure, through mistakes, he learned where everything he had to come from. It was a lesson that would serve him well when he became king. Because he always realised that he was but a vassal king in the service of the true king. And in that sense, you see, David books the trend. Do you remember, well, some of you may, when we were looking, it was last summer now, we were in 1 Samuel chapter 8. And we read about how the Israelites wanted a king like the other nations. And Samuel warned them. What did he say? This is what the king who will reign over you will do. He'll take. He'll take your sons. He'll take your daughters. The best of your fields. The vineyards. Olive groves. Flocks. Take, 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 take. That's earthly kingship. That's earthly leadership. That was Saul's kingship. And to this very day, that's how secular leadership works. What you have is mine. And David was very different. And David anticipates a very different ruler to come. A kind and a generous king. One who by rights was entitled to all things. The king of kings. But one who humbled himself, becoming a servant. One who came to give his life. His precious life, a ransom for many. And David, at his greatest, was a foreshadow of that greatest of kings to come. Now, of course, it would still be a thousand years from this point until God's son came into the world. And in fact, even today and not until he returns, will every knee bow and every tongue confess that he is king and Lord. And in the meantime... Many, many lesser kings have ruled in this world and still rule in this world, taking what isn't theirs, exceeding their authority, ruling selfishly, ruling without God to this day. And the book of 1 Samuel ends with such a man, Saul, a man who is everything that David isn't. David had the means of grace and valued them. 
He remembered the Lord's kindness to him. He sought the Lord's guidance. He rested in the Lord's provision. Saul, he despised what he had until it was finally removed forever. David gives us the sense of a man who sought the Lord for who the Lord was. He wanted communion with his divine friend. Saul? Saul only ever seeks the Lord for information. Please help me with this or that. Saul had no loving relationship with God. His concern was always for himself. And it remains so right up until the end. And what a sad end it is. Chapter 31 gives us a brief, tragic account of how it ended. And it's an inevitable end, but tragic all the same. This massive Philistine invasion force meets Saul's army in the plain of Jezreel, the valley of Jezreel. And the level ground of the valley is perfect for the Philistine chariots. And Israel are overwhelmed and they're routed. They flee for their lives. Some of them make their final stand on the slopes of Mount Gilboa. They have the high ground there, and for a time they have safety from the Philistine chariots, but it's short-lived. They're sitting ducks for the Philistine archers. Many Israelites are slain. Saul's sons, including Jonathan, are killed, and Saul is critically wounded. Spare a thought for Jonathan. He's one of the heroes of this book, a man who loved God, a faithful friend to God's man David, and yet, at the same time, a loyal son to his father. Jonathan is a man of real integrity. He didn't deserve this fate. And yet, was it really a tragedy for Jonathan? I think Dale Ralph Davis puts it perfectly. He says, Jonathan laid aside a kingdom he couldn't have to enter a kingdom he couldn't lose. But as for Saul, he lost everything. It is the inevitable end of a man who had already willfully lost the most precious thing he had, access to God and his word. He'd lost that and now he will lose his life. He's there slowly dying and he knows what it will mean if the pagan Philistines take him alive. It would mean a dishonourable, torturous, prolonged death. And so he asks his armour bearer to finish him off, to spare him the ordeal. And his armour bearer rightly refuses. Like David, he will not slay the Lord's anointed, no matter what the circumstances. And so Saul, in despair, falls on his own sword. Yes, he thwarts the Philistines from having their way with him, but he doesn't thwart the word of the Lord. No one can. Do you remember these words of the Lord? Now, we have to go all the way back to chapter 2 for this. These words, those who honour me, I will honour. But those who despise me will be disdained. That's what the word of God said to Eli and his sons. And God was faithful to it. And he remains faithful to it at the end of the book. God's the true king of Israel. He's still on the throne. He can't be mocked. Saul has despised God. And now he's despised. Because you see, unlike Saul, God doesn't say one thing and then do another. God doesn't make idle threats. God is unchangingly true and faithful to what he has said. And that works both ways, doesn't it? If you're trusting in Jesus, he says, you're mine. And that's that. Your salvation will never be rescinded. Once a child of God, always a child of God. But if a person tramples on God's grace and shakes their fist at God, then he will give them over to their sin and judgment is sure. Judgment won't be rescinded. Now, even in the darkest of times, God has heroes. Two miles east of the Jordan is a fortified town called Jabesh Gilead. The inhabitants of the town hear the devastating news of Israel's defeat, and they hear the disgraceful news that Saul and his sons have been killed and their bodies have been hung up in the Philistine city of Beth Shan. And the brave men of Jabesh Gilead stand up for the honour of Jehovah and of their fallen king. They travel at breakneck speed at night. They recover the bodies of Saul and his sons. Now Saul wasn't deserving of their courage. And yet these people had never forgotten how many decades earlier 
the young King Saul, had delivered their town from the Ammonite king. It was the high point in Saul's reign, his one shining moment. And it makes us feel sad, doesn't it? How far Saul had fallen. What might have been had he but trusted and obeyed the Lord. But he didn't. Rather than seeking to deliver his people from their enemies, Saul devotes himself to keeping his kingdom for himself and preventing David from becoming king. And Saul is the king that Samuel warned about all those years ago. He's the one who takes, 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 until the point that there is nothing else to take but his own life. And Saul takes his own life, but be under no illusions. It's the Lord who takes Saul's life. 1 Chronicles 10 gives us an interesting assessment of Saul. We don't get it in this book, but we get it in 1 Chronicles. And it says, Saul died because he was unfaithful to the Lord. He didn't keep the word of the Lord and even consulted a medium for guidance and did not inquire of the Lord. So the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David son of Jesse. That's the long and short of it. Saul's life and his death is a sober warning to us all of what happens when a person despises their privilege and hardens their heart against what they know. Are we in danger of doing that today? May we all be warned. If it's a tragedy for Saul, it's a national tragedy for Israel. They'd asked for this king, a king like the other nations, to lead us in battle. But their demand was selfish and it was godless. It was rooted in fear, not faith. And now it's all ended in misery and defeat, which is where all selfish and godless demands end. And there's no more fearful thing than God giving people and nations what they sinfully want. May our nation be warned. And yet if you think, what a sad end to the book of 1 Samuel, remember this, the darkest part of the night is just before the dawn. You see, from the ashes of defeat, God is about to usher in a glorious new dawn. A greater than Saul is about to arrive. In fact, he's already arrived. And all the apparent chaos, all the wilderness wanderings, all the mistakes, it had all been for a reason. God was training David for the kingship. And unlike Saul, David didn't despise what God taught him. And through failure, David learnt to trust in his Lord. And he would rise to be Israel's greatest king. And he would usher in a golden age in Israel. Not because Israel deserved it. Not even because David was worthy. But because the true king is faithful to his promises. David is God's grace to Israel. Now, of course, even, even David failed. As king, just 11 chapters into chapter to, into 2 Samuel, and what do we find? Oh, David's committed adultery. Oh, David's a murderer. And it makes you really depressed, and you think, well, is this dawn just a false dawn? Well, there is a sense in which every dawn is a false dawn, if it relies upon a human leader. Remember that main theme in 1 Samuel. A quest for a king worth following. And even great David couldn't live up to that. And over many centuries his descendants failed too. And finally, in 587 BC, Jerusalem was destroyed and the Jewish kingdom ended forever. And just like the period of the judges, the era of Eli and Samuel, so the period of the kings ends in failure. And yet David, imperfect though he was was a righteous man who delivered Israel from her enemies. David was a type of a greater king to come. And David himself knew he wasn't the answer. David wasn't proud. David knew who the true king was. He looked forward in faith to a coming king. And Jesus is that king, isn't he? Great David's greater son. Come to usher in a glorious gospel dawn. Saul, he died in despair, defeated by his enemies, 
Jesus, he died in victory, having disarmed Satan and the powers of evil on the cross, having borne our sins in his body, taking their condemnation, swallowing up death's sting, opening heaven's gates for all who believe. And the glorious gospel age has begun. We live in its light today. The faithful remnant that God has always had has swollen, hasn't it, and grown from a few in Israel to a vast number of Jews and Gentiles right across the world. Yep, there is still a competing people. Satan has his followers, still, those looking for human answers. And they still dominate in our world. There are many rulers like Saul, people who take, 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 who won't humbly bow their knee before the King of Heaven. But one day, and it's coming soon, very soon, one day, the true dawn will rise and the king will return in power and glory to consummate his victory, to usher in the glory of the eternal kingdom. That's what's coming up. Are you ready for that day? When every tear will be wiped away? When sin will be removed and you'll see the king face to face? Well, that's a frightful prospect for people like Saul. Judgment is what they will face. But weak as you are, unimportant as we are, in the grand scheme of things, if we're simply trusting that Jesus has forgiven our sins, well, that dawn will be glorious. If you don't know him, you can get to know Jesus today. You don't have to go through any religious ceremonies. Just talk to him. Tell him that you're a sinner You've messed up. Ask him to forgive your sins and he will. He'll reconcile you with God. And if you already know him, I think the prevailing lesson, the enduring lesson from this book is keep your eyes fixed upwards, fixed on him. The dawn is coming. And in the meantime, strength and grace is to be found in him. Amen.